was six years ago uh, that I was officiating a wedding for a lovely couple in Revelstoke. Now, they had graciously provided for our young family. Like we had, Connor was uh, two and Adam was like five months old or something. They graciously provided two nights accommodation at the, at the ski hill. That's where the, the, the wedding was taking place. So, so we packed up our young family, uh, which is um, always a joy, in quotes, uh, it's a huge task. I, I, the back of our truck was full. I think I was like tarping stuff down. It was uh, ridiculous. Play pens, food, toys. What a chore. Anyways, um, I should mention that this family or this, this young couple that was getting married, well, she was a wedding planner. So she professionally makes things look beautiful. Okay. And he was a photographer, um, probably the one of the best I've ever known. His uh, photos are featured in ski magazines around the world. So these are people who love things to be just so. <laughs> and this wedding was beautiful. You know, I was getting ready for the day. It just was a couple hours beforehand. I was rereading my notes, making sure all my transitions, I kind of had those in my head at least. And, um, and I was, you know, making sure I had all the documentation. I got this like legal obligation of filling all the paperwork, got all that. And then I asked my wife, Catherine, have you seen my suit? Um, I just, I can't seem to find it, and I've kind of looked everywhere at this point. And then so I, was, I, I no was her answer, and so I was racking my brain. I was like, oh yeah, I know where it is. It's at home, uh, in my cupboard, where I left it so I could pack it. Um, we're in Revelstoke. Kamloops is far too far away. So now I'm in frantic mode, a little bit of panic. I make a phone call to like the only place in Revelstoke that might possibly rent a suit. Oh, we don't rent suits, I'm sorry. Uh, we do sell some, but we don't have many sizes. I'm not sure if we'd be able to fit you. I'm like, oh my goodness. I don't have time to drive into Salmon Arm either. And so at, at, at this point, I am, you know, I can't even purchase one. I can't rent one. This is not good. Like you can't do that in a shirt t-shirt and jeans. Um, this was, th that just wouldn't do, especially not this wedding. So I'm incredibly embarrassed. I walk down to the guy, the groom's room, and I, and I knock on the door, and I explain. And he says, oh, we rented an extra suit. I almost cried with relief. <laughs> I was, and it was probably the nicest suit I think I've ever worn. Um, and it fit the aesthetic far better than my own suit would have on that day. Now, someone asked me, did it fit well? I said, well, not really. I sort of, <laughs> it was very tight. But it looked good for that day. Uh, there's this kind of, there's a, there's a kind of life. There is a, a pattern of behavior that is fitting for the new nature of those who belong to God. And there's patterns of life that simply don't fit. They won't work in that situation. In our chunk today, Paul moves from his weighty theological arguments about staying rooted in Jesus, about who Jesus is, and then he moves into very specific instructions for the church today. With Jesus' death and resurrection, a new beginning has dawned. But what does that really look like for us so far, we've seen the logic of the letter goes like this. Since this is who Jesus is, this is who you are, and now this is what it means for how you live. Paul's saying, become in your relationships, in your attitudes, in your, in your postures of your heart, what God in Christ has already made you to be. Basically, become what you are. Be what you are. This, this passage you'll see falls into really kind of three parts that we'll look at today. The first part is like a hinge to the little letter. It connects this vision of Jesus and how to, with how to live under his gracious rule. The second part uses this metaphor of clothing. Take this off, put that on. And the third part, well, it really focuses on how the community needs to keep pushing each other to know and love Jesus and glorify him. So, Part one, getting a new perspective. Part two, getting changed. And three, giving glory to God. Let's pray. God, I'm so thankful that you inspired the Apostle Paul to write this text in this way. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that our hearts would be open and ready to receive from you whatever you're saying to us as a church through this text today. In Christ's name, 
Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd encourage you to, uh, to, to flip to Colossians chapter 3, and we're going to read from 1 to 17 and work through that this morning. Here's where Paul starts on this section. Since then, you've been raised with Christ. Now that since then points us back into what Paul has already been saying. In the passage that we looked at last week, um, Paul talks about our, uh, the, the baptism that Christians undergo. It's this idea that... Um, we're signaling when we go under the water that our old life dominated by self-centeredness, it's done, it's over. And when we come up out of the water, that signals that we're participating in the resurrection of Jesus, that we are a new creature. So he says, since you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died. Again, your old life is over, as we already talked about. For you died, and now your life is hidden with Christ in God. I love that imagery. There's this picture of like us being enfolded into the life of the kingdom, almost like in the arms of our Savior, I picture. We're transferred, as Paul has said, from the kingdom or the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of the Son. That's where we stand, Paul says. So remember that. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Now this section, I think, is really easy to misread and misunderstand. We might think it means something like this. Oh, we're not supposed to think about what's going on on this kind of earthly level. We're supposed to focus on going to heaven. Well, that can't really be. Because everything Paul says following this is about how to live in our relationships in the here and now, in light of Jesus' resurrection, in light of the fact that he will come again. I think Tim Mackey summarizes this well. He says, no part of human existence remains untouched by the loving and liberating rule of Jesus. We're invited to live in the present as if the new creation really arrived when Jesus rose from the dead. And I think he's got it exactly right because that's true. When Jesus rose from the dead, a new beginning was started. And because that happened, this is how we're to live, the new creation way. And that, Paul tells us, will be finally and fully realized when Jesus returns. So we're looking forward to that day, and it's as though we're living into the future. So if that's true, how do we live? That's Paul's big point here. As we fix our attention on Jesus, that will change both how we see and what we love. See, this command not only gives us a new vision, but it also protects our hearts. How? Uh, Fourth century theologian Athanasius, uh, when he's kind of describing this, he, he talks about the plight of humans as a misdirection of the senses. Here's what he writes. Human beings have turned their eyes no longer upward, but downward. They were seeking about God in nature and in the world of sense, feigning or inventing gods for themselves. Athanasius is saying, when people go looking for God, they're gonna find something to make into their God. Your heart will always love something. It will be given entirely to someone. And Athanasius is saying, if that someone is not Jesus, you'll make something else your God. Paul's words to us, fix your eyes on your Savior. Because we're all lovers. One biblical scholar commenting on on this text and this, this, this uh, this quote from Athanasius, I think she's got it right. She says, human beings do not seek for that which they ought to seek. They do not orient their lives toward God. And we don't. We don't just naturally say, where is the one true living God? I orient my life to that God. No, we don't. She's right on that. This is the predicament from which human beings are delivered as they're joined to the death and resurrection of Jesus. It's this idolatry, this loving something other than God as my first and best. That's what we're delivered from when we come to Jesus. That's what Jesus frees us from. So we fix our eyes upward on Jesus as our risen and exalted Lord, and then we begin to see life from his perspective. But what does that actually look like? Like, how do we do that? Well, we don't have to guess. Look at verse 5. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs 
to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. There's that idea again. Greed, the wanting for something more than being satisfied with God. Boy, that makes idols out of objects or people or sex. Because of these, Paul says, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways. That was normal life for you guys before. I know it was. In the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Don't lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here, like in the kingdom realm, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Uh, in the ancient world, this list that we just read, um, all moral philosophers would include those. They were called like vice lists. Uh, but Paul, he, sp he spins this. This isn't just his list of vices. This is all linked back into the gospel. This is a gospel vice list, you might say. Paul says, put to death whatever belongs to the earthly nature, meaning the inward bent of my heart toward myself and my own needs, my own wants, that self-centered nature and everything that flows out of that, Paul says, put it to death. Notice, this is an, to get really nerdy grammar-wise, it's an, it's an active imperative verb. Active, doing something. Imperative, that's you, that's, that's what we do. So it's an imperative, it's an active, which suggests, not just suggests, it tells us, <laughs> um, we need to actively participate in the, in the life that God has called us into. Think of your old life like a, like a rip current in the ocean or like the, the, the current of a stream. Uh, do nothing and you will be pulled along with it, with the flow. Our sinful nature is like that riptide. There will be genuine effort on our part to work against the tides of life. And you might ask, and I hope you do, well, Dave, but what about grace? Great question. One writer puts it really well, I think. Grace is not opposed to effort, but to earning. God's grace, his kindness expressed in the giving of his son to win us back, it includes the new life with Jesus, but it also includes the strength to live that life. Grace reminds us that we cannot earn God's acceptance, that it's totally free through the finished work of Jesus on your behalf and mine. But grace doesn't mean that we just simply sit back and make no effort. No, we're empowered by God's spirit, God living in us to actually swim against the tide of what our earthly nature would pull us along with. This text reminds us with this stack of imperative verbs like put to death and then later put off and clothe yourselves that we actively participate in the new life that God enables through Jesus. But that sounds hard, you might say. Yeah, that would be true. Following Jesus is really hard. But God's spirit enables us to do it. We're not alone. But it tells us you can't do this on your own. Without God's life in you, this will be impossible. So are you open to his life in you? I guess that's the question it brings us back to. Notice also, God will not allow evil patterns of life to persist forever. There will come a day of wrath. That's a word that means God's settled opposition to anything that distorts or destroys his good design for his good creation. God will one day end all evil. Isn't that good news? That's good news. Evil will no longer be a part of God's glorious future. But Paul says, distorted sexuality and destructive words and ways these have no place in God's kingdom, and one day they will be gone. So where do you want to be at the end of all of that? How could you possibly align yourself with a life living that pattern if that pattern is going to be destroyed one day? God's wrath is coming against that. So what is fitting for you to wear? You know, I, uh, I grew up on a little farm in, uh, in Salmon Arm, and um, I knew my share of taking off the sort of clothes that were unfitting <laughs> 
to wear inside the house. See, we'd be playing all afternoon in the mud, in pig pen, in pasture, and chicken coop, and at the end of the day, we'd show up on the porch, and we were covered head to toe and smelled of everything you could imagine. And it was at that point that we would have to, we didn't have a mudroom, so we would be stripped down, yes, all the way, and then we had a hose. And then, you know, in the early spring, that was fairly chilly, um, but for good reason. We could not enter into this new, this space that was clean in the state that we were in. We couldn't continue to live in our stained, stinking clothes inside the house. And Paul's argument is similar. You can't continue to wear that kind of life, stained by lust-driven, destructive living, inside the new reality. It doesn't fit with your new life that's been given you by grace. And that's so key to note here. We don't clean ourselves. Remember, Paul had been just using um, the arguments where he's talking about how Jesus nailed all of our sins to the cross. He's disarmed all the powers that work against our guilt and shame. That's already taken care of in the cross. And our baptism, it looks like a bath because it's signaling that we have been cleaned by Jesus. Paul's already made that argument. So you don't have to clean yourself up, get your life together, look like, you know, what you're supposed to look like on your own steam. No, that's, that's where the grace comes. But that doesn't mean we can stay there. That means, well, that means this. We do take off the old life. You can't keep wearing the same clothes. As Paul says, but now, that signals a change. Yes, that was a part of your old life, but now, the sexual immorality, that living out of line with God's intent for sexuality, the lust, the evil desires, the greed, these are not fitting. The way that you use your words to injure others, not fitting. That is over. And you might be thinking now, how do you actually enact that? So, so you're maybe a believer right now, and you're thinking, I want to live that. that. I don't want to wear the old clothes. But your question is, how? And I thought, you know what, Paul doesn't tell us how. Until I sat back and I actually just reflected a little longer and prayed a little more. And I said, actually, Paul tells us exactly how. Our first practice, or maybe I'm going to call it a heart-shaping habit, goes right back to the first verses we just looked at. To borrow the sports cliche, the best... Defense is a good, oh, I love that you guys know your sports cliches. That's awesome. That's just totally not my world, so I'm glad you know them. Um, Verses 1 to 4, Paul's told us to focus our attention where? On Christ, on the things above, on his kingly rule. Raise our eyes. It's by reflecting on Jesus through regular scripture reading, like like being a part of the world of the scripture, being uh, indwelling that, letting the text speak to our hearts. Um, That reorients us to begin to want the things that God wants. It comes through prayer, just humble connection to God, uh, talking with other believers about the glory of what Jesus has done for us because there'll be times that you will be tempted. Well, you know that. I don't need to tell you this, but we're tempted to live the old patterns of life, right? Right? And if we just throw her in neutral, guess what? You'll just be dragged along with it. That is what will happen. That will be your life if you live in neutral. But as we cultivate that closeness with Jesus, lift our eyes, Paul says. Seek his perspective. Our hearts will stay in tune with his. When we cultivate that through reflecting on the gospel, our affections for the things of God will grow. We'll begin to want what God wants for us. But uh, perhaps not so cliche, but it works as well. Uh, Also, a good defense is a good defense. (laughs) When we experience stimulus of any sort, a temptation, something comes into your life that makes you mad, say, or that tempts you toward lust, um, what our sin nature does, because it's in neutral, it just goes stimulus response or, you know, temptation reaction. Here's what I think we need to do. (laughs) When that stimulus comes, God, this makes you really mad, you get to hit pause and say, Holy Spirit, come and help me to respond appropriately now. We're not on our own. (laughs) Jesus said, I am with you always. And that means actually in your character too. So the next time something comes into your life and you say, God, that makes me mad, don't turn it into prayer. Turn it into God, that makes me mad. Help me respond appropriately. We're not on our own. Now, this taking off of the old life, 
is not just learning to be nice people, but being entirely new people with a whole new nature. That's what God gives us when we trust in Jesus. Like the, 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 new, the, the suit that I received on that wedding day, man, I did nothing to earn it. In fact, the opposite was true. I had made a disaster of that moment, and yet I was gifted this suit. Now, it was up to me to go back to my room and put it on. Now, this will be utterly central. Pardon me. So you and I have a part to play, and Paul tells us that. And Paul tells us what this new nature actually looks like. But first, he grounds all that he's about to say in this line that we've read, that God is renewing you in the image of the creator. He is actually bringing you back to what you were intended to be from the very beginning. And this is utterly central to actually living out the new creation life in the Jesus community. Paul says this, more or less, Christ is in all of you who believe. He's in you and me. And that entirely transforms all of your relationships. The common racial and social divisions that belong to the world, they're opposed to the kingdom life, Paul says. You must live totally different in the household of God. What Paul says here is absolutely radical for the people of Colossae who were deeply ingrained in the thinking and philosophy of the ancient Greco-Roman world. See, the Greco-Roman world is really influenced by Plato and, philo uh, Plato and Aristotle in particular. Here's what Plato writes in the fourth century. He says that nature herself, and what he means is that's just the way things are. Like that's the way that the universe sets stuff up, okay? Nature herself intimates that it is just for the better to have more than the worse, the more powerful than the weaker, and in many ways, she, again nature, shows among men as well, as well as among animals, and indeed among whole cities and races, that justice consists in the superior ruling over and having more than the inferior. The Colossian church would have been deeply ingrained with this way of thinking. That was normal life in the Greco-Roman world, to see this sort of gradient of uh, social higher and lower, and who gets more and who gets less. Aristotle similarly says it like this, for that some should rule and others be ruled is a thing not only necessary but expedient. From the hour of their birth, some are marked out for subjection, some for rule. For these philosophers, slaves, women, and children, they are the weaker, the less intelligent, those who are subject to be ruled to have less. They're to be ruled by powerful men who are to have the larger share of resources and power in the world. That's the Greco-Roman worldview. That's how they functioned. That's the order of the universe they appeal to, right? They said nature itself intends this. But Paul comes from a totally different angle. He says there's no longer any Jew or Gentile. That racial division is over. It's done. It's, it's no longer valid. There's no longer slave or free. You guys have walked into this thinking slaves are slaves because nature intended that from their birth. That they're meant to be ruled over. Paul says, no, the gospel will have none of that. There's this reordering of the structure of the universe under the good news of Jesus the gospel totally shifts everything you thought was true about relationships, Paul says. In Galatians, Paul even adds male and female to the same kind of list. Those divisions of higher and lower are over in Christ. Can you see how radical that would be to his listeners? Everything you thought was true about the power structures of the world is over in Christ. It's torn down through his work. The lines humans draw, they're invalid. Racial divisions, totally over. Now, this new reality, it has to be realized to be lived out, not merely paying lip service to the end of these early valu earthly valuation systems, but to put it into practice in reality. There can no longer be a plus and minus system in our relating. What do I mean by that? Um, one of my profs, uh, Dr. Joyce Bellows from McMaster, um, she said, Two things that I think really help us in this. They've always stuck with me. First, when we function merely out of um, human valuation systems, whenever we walk into a room, there's this thing that happens. It's either, you know, it might be really subtle or maybe it's not so subtle. 
But basically, it goes like this. Do I look up to this person or look down on them? Um, are they above me or are they below me? Are they a two or are they a zero? That might sound a bit crass to your ears at first. You think that's not really how things work. Uh, but think about it. Does it happen when you meet people? In your own heart, in any way? Do you ever sense that you're being inspected in that way? It happens all the time. Why is it that one of the first questions that men ask each other when they meet is, so what do you do for work? I mean, maybe it's just out of interest, but I think a lot of times it's actually to find out where do I fit in this? Do I look up or do I look down? Where do we fit on the social scale? And do you see how the gospel renders this valuation system null and void? How it must work that kind of posturing out of our hearts? Again, Paul says in verse 11, here, this means in Christ's kingdom and his way of things going, there is no Jew or Gentile. Each of these groups deeply despised the other in the ancient world. They looked down on each other. And so Paul says, you can't do that anymore. No. No circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or fee, but Christ is all and is in all. Here's what Paul is saying. If you look at another believer, Christ is in them. It's utterly true of them. So can you look at another person seeing Christ in them and then say, oh, I can look down on this person? Do you look down on Christ? You, you can't. <laughs> how, could you, how could that possibly make sense? And Paul says Christ is in all all who trust in him. So there are no twos and zeros. There's everyone has a value of one, is what Paul says. There is this great reality of the gospel that each of us can refer to each other as brother and sister. Now, now Debbie, um, I think she usually goes to the first service here, but every time Debbie and I meet, she says, you're my brother, Dave, and I say, and you're my sister, Debbie. She reminds me every single time we meet that there's no twos or zeros, there's no up and there's no down, that the language that the gospel gives to the church is brother and sister. And that's just utterly true of who we are. It's a beautiful reality that there are no twos and zeros, there's only ones. And I, I put the emphasis on other believers because that's what Paul is doing in this text. But it's true that every person is made in the image of God and although that image has been tarnished, it really has through our sin, we still need to treat all people with dignity as God's sacred creation, his image bearers. Uh, the second thing my prof said is much simpler, uh, but deadly to the point as well. She said this, godliness is not being a snob. Uh, Paul says it like this in Romans 12, 16, live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud, don't be, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Don't be conceited. See, as long as the valuation structure of this earthly realm remains intact in a church setting, that church in Colossae and we today will not be able to put on the kinds of clothes of the renewed community that Paul speaks of next. Pride, another way of saying being a snob, <laughs> pride, C.S. Lewis says, is essentially comparison. It's competitiveness with others. So long as you think you're either superior or inferior to others in the community, there will continue to be that looking up or down. And Paul notes that the gospel radically reforms the value structures then and now. This leads to our second practice, our heart-shaping habit. If we're going to put on this new way of being human, we will have to unmask and demote every form of valuation that elevates some and despises or pushes others down. This means paying attention deeply to how we make evaluations in our world. So we ask questions like this. Who is valued in our world and why? Uh, who is not valued and why? What are the markers in our world of those who are in and those who are out? Like, you know, what factors are used to judge the relative worth of people in our world? Here's just a, a few things that I chucked down. I just thought, well, what would I say? And I wrote a few things down on my piece of paper. I said this. Well, I think there's things like career and work, your work situation, your income, uh, the neighborhood that you live in, your relationship status. Are you married or not married? Race or ethnic background? And yes, it seems like I think it actually matters more than we want to admit today still. Education? Like what degrees do you have or not have? Your age. And something that often gets linked to that is, what do you look like? Then we ask questions like this. To what extent 
do these factor into how we relate to each other in the community of faith? And most importantly, how will we recognize the inherent worth, gifts, and contributions so that everybody is valued and puts their gifts to work in our community? I think that's a huge part of what Paul is doing in this section. He's unmasking and clearing away the valuation system in order to offer us something completely new, the kingdom way. And then he fills it in with the content. Now, when we would get hosed down, um, we would leave our dirty clothes outside on the patio, and then we would go inside to a hot bath. It was lovely. But you know, we would not dream of walking back outside, you know, toweling off and going and finding our wet clothes and like putting those back on again. You wouldn't dream of doing that. Paul has paved the way for us to put on the new clothes, the new way of living. But he's done it partly by devaluing the Greco-Roman valuation system. And now he can say, now you're ready to put on the clothes that are fitting of the new creation. Therefore, verse 12, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves. Now stop just for a second again. Notice, this is key, putting on these new clothes Everything Paul is about to say as well, this is not go clean up your life, get your act together. Maybe when you start looking like a Christian, you can come back into the community. No. Chosen. Holy. God made you holy through Jesus. Dearly loved. It's almost too wonderful to say. Everything he's about to say is based off of who you are in Christ. We sang it this morning. I am who you say I am. Believe that. Do you believe it? It's the question. I think that completely transforms the motivation of our hearts when we know I get to love with the love of Jesus because I've been loved by the love of Jesus. It's far more motivating than fear of judgment or the pride of saying, well, I got my act cleaned up. What about you? You know, sometimes Catherine and I have have acted out of frustration with each other when it comes to house chores. You think, no, really, yes, actually. Um, But here's what I've noticed. When each of us is thinking about the other, how can I make life easier for Catherine? This is what she's got going on in her day. What can I do to pave the way for that? When she thinks, how can I serve Dave and his needs today? I know he's busy with X, Y, and Z. And when we act out of that place, boy, you know what you want to do on the other side of that? Is to reciprocate that love. There's this, man, you've been loved So love, you've been forgiven, so forgive. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Uh, In 1912, a theologian from Princeton, uh, B.B. Warfield, he published an essay called The Emotional Life of Our Lord. He studied the four Gospels, and he was looking for the words that the Gospel writers used to describe sort of the emotional um, center of Jesus' life. Like, what are the words that they used to describe him? And, you know, what was it? Maybe maybe it was anger at the Pharisees and their sort of um, just wrong-headedness about the kingdom of God. Or maybe it was... I don't know, maybe it was frustration with the disciples for never really quite getting it. The number one word to describe the emotional life of our Lord is compassion. Uh, one writer, Frederick Beekner, he defines compassion like, as the fatal capacity for feeling what it's like to live inside someone else's skin. It's the knowledge that there can never really be any peace and joy for me until there's peace and joy finally for you too. You'll notice then, compassion, putting it on, it's not just an emotional state. It's a choice. It's a decision to sense, to imagine what life is like for you right now. And how would that change how you treat a person if you approached it like that? If our commitment was to compassion and wearing that? Well, I think it's no coincidence what Paul mentions next. He speaks about kindness, that generosity that seeks the best for the other. And after all, that's really what humility is at the end of the day. It's thinking about the other person, what their needs are, and then giving deeply to meet those needs, not feeling ourselves too big to serve. Remember, if the valuation system of the world is brought in line with God's ways through the gospel, there's only looking straight across. 
It's, it's not up or down any longer. Humility, then, is the only appropriate response and posture for those who follow a crucified Messiah. The one who, as Paul says in Philippians 2, being in very nature God, didn't use his equality with God as something for his own advantage. No, he made himself nothing, taking on the position of a slave all the way to serving you through dying on a cross in your place. Following a crucified Messiah, then, means a posture of humility. And, and that same sort of gentleness and patience that Jesus has with you and me, he says we're to have with each other. And what exactly is the Messiah doing, dying on that cross anyways? Well, he is actually bearing our sins. He's paying for them. And that's what our forgiving means too. To forgive those who hurt us in the end, is to make the decision not to hold it against them. To use their wrong as leverage, to let it function as a divide, to bring it up in the future, to make sure that they feel what they made me feel. To forgive someone is to release them from a debt, to say, you don't owe me anything anymore. And to be open to reconciliation. Now, it's not identical to reconciliation. Some people want to be reconciled and to have that relationship cut back together. Other people don't. Our part is to forgive, though. And that would make at least the way to reconciliation possible on our end. There's so much to be said about this topic that I can't cover this morning. I wish I could say more. But for this morning, we need to see that bearing with each other and forgiving as quickly and completely as the Master forgave us, that's how Eugene Peterson puts it, and I love it, that's what it means to be a grace-based community. And it will be necessary for our life together. <laughs> Um, the truth is, as we walk the Jesus way as a community, we will not always get it right. I certainly don't. Um, you better believe that we'll be seeking forgiveness and granting it often. And if a community isn't committed to doing that, it will fall apart because the grace community needs to be seasoned by grace. I think that's why Paul mentions putting on love as the virtue which binds all of these together. As one scholar puts it, the other virtues pursued without love, they become distorted and unbalanced. And when we live this way, we see that peace results. Look at verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. It's got to be master. It's got to be king of the way you make decisions. Let the peace of Christ be king over your decision making. Since as members of one body, you are called to peace and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now this is a beautiful text. And I think it would be easy for us to miss just how challenging this text is as well. You see, it's easy for us to see our faith life is kind of a private thing. And to talk about your relationship with Jesus out loud with other people, sometimes we feel like that's, that's like talking about stuff that's just supposed to be in a bedroom almost. You know, it just seems like it should be private. But in the Jesus community, we're to cultivate regularly gathering for worship, celebrating the good news of Jesus, speaking about, singing about his grace in a way that leads to joyful celebration and thanks. But notice too, there's this mutual encouragement that's going on in this text. Teaching one another with the message of Christ. And this is key. When a friend comes to you and they've got something big and it's, it's weighty and you don't know, you know, they're coming to you for advice. And so what do you do? You give them good advice. But the temptation is to just do that. Man, I don't want to sound preachy. I don't want to bring Jesus into this. So I'll just give them some good advice. Paul says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. That's what you use to teach each other. Good advice is fine, but we need better than that. We need good news. So when someone comes to you for advice, your role, my role is to say, okay, how does what Jesus has done for us on the cross and through his resurrection and, and the new kind of community he makes us into, how does that speak to this situation? Can we do that? That's really our third heart-shaping posture, is that mutual encouragement and accountability. It's to consistently remind each other of the new life we have in Christ, and then let's say, let's, let's do good news. Let's let that be the topic, the, the, the modus operandi is to let 
good news be the center of how we discuss whatever issue we're facing? The question is then, how does the gospel of Jesus, his life, his teaching, his grace, how does that speak to this issue? When we do the peace of Christ and the joy of aiming our lives at the glory of God, that's what we get to experience. And that, in the end, is what we're made for, to glorify God. That is why you exist. So the question is, what are you wearing? Is it fit for kingdom life? And will you, with God's help, maybe you need to get changed today. Maybe you need to get changed for the first time. Maybe you've never heard this news before. And I want to tell you that today you can step into the life-changing, cleaning, new relationship with Jesus. That can be yours through faith today. Let's pray. God, I thank you that, um, that this text challenges us. It reminds us that being yours means being changed. And I'm so grateful, Lord, because I want what you want for me today. And I pray as a community that we'd be able to say, we want what you want for us today, Lord. We want to look like your son Jesus in our character, in our patterns of life, in the way that we evaluate people and, and situations. And Lord, we ask that you would enable us by your spirit to let the good news of Jesus just dwell among us richly. That we might live gospel-shaped in every way. In Christ's name we pray, amen.